Thanks for joining us on American Medicine Today. I'm Kimberly Bermel, joined by Ethan Euchre. Glad to be here. Our friend Jeff Wagstaff. Hello, friend. Thanks for having me. And world-renowned orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Alfred Benatti of the Benatti Spine Institute. Now, this is truly exciting because joining us is Dr. Anthony Atala, director of Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, where they have developed a 3D bioprinter, which can literally construct organs in a laboratory in a matter of hours. Thank you for being here. Nice to be with you today. Dr. Atala, we spent, Kimberly and I, a oh. bunch of time watching your TED Talks, a lot of the stuff that you have online. It's captivating. It's absolutely amazing. Yes. A lot to get into in a short amount of time. How, when, when and how did you first realize that a printer could be used to print organs. living tissue and organs? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we started by printing just cells. But before that, many years before, we started creating tissues by hand. So that's really how we got started. The whole concept was how can we generate tissues and organs for patients. And so we started looking at the cell biology, material sciences, and started to design these first by hand before we actually got into 3D printing about 14 years ago. And I know you actually made, by you talk about doing things by hand, yeah. some of the first things that you ever did was, uh, you're a urologist by practice, you made by hand bladders, bladders <laughs> and put them into people, transplanted them, and, and they went on to live productive lives. That's incredible. Yeah, the strategies, you take the cell from the patient. You take a very small piece of tissue from the patient. You right. grow the cells outside the body. You create this three-dimensional construct that then you're able to place in an oven-like device and you cook it, if you will, very much in the same conditions as the human body and then put it back into the patient. And that's basically the strategy. And because it has their own cells, there's no... Uh, Rejection. Correct, Dr. Venati. Yes. That's right. Because the cells are coming from the same patient, really you do avoid any challenges with rejection. This is really amazing. Let me let me ask you something. Uh, I understand that you are trying to do also um, larger um, organs like kidneys or probably hearts. Um, do you already try to do some, some kidneys? Yeah, we've actually printed many different structures in the laboratory. So we've printed miniature kidneys, livers, lungs, hearts. The strategy is how to create these solid organs and put them into patients. And we really divide the organs by their complexity with flat structures such as skin being the least complex, tubular structures such as blood vessels being the second level of complexity, hollow non-tubular organs like the stomach or the bladder being the next level. And by far the most complex are the solid other organs like the heart, the liver, or the kidney. When when you de when you develop that bladder, how how you replace the neurological behavior? Because how that thing work in response to to uh, the trusor type of a nerve. Basically, any structure that we engineer, we are relying on having normal nerves and normal blood vessels right to the construct. And so we basically are replicating what normal tissue development is inside the body. So by placing the cells and the scaffolds in the right environment, the body will then naturally innervate and vascularize or naturally bring nerves and blood vessels to these tissues. Then regenerate the nerve that's going to be functional, uh, it, it, anatomically functional for that organ. That's what you're saying. Exactly. Okay. Then then this can be an incredible type of uh, possibilities to do some, some type of corrections on an individual with the spinal cord damage. Well, the spinal cord's a lot more complex because when you're talking about these peripheral nerves, the nerves that are actually in certain types of tissues and organs, you're talking about a very different innervation, of course, as you know, than the spinal cord would be much much more complex because I make the analogy that the spinal cord is like these big cables that you see underground. There are thousands of wires going through, and so it's much more complex than just uh, single nerves. But the possibility is there, am I right? Definitely. You know, I think one of the things in science is you never say never, so yeah. th definite possibilities for the future. Well, and what else is uh, interesting as well when he talks mm -hmm. about what's on the horizon, and I know Dr. Atala is always reluctant mm -hmm. to put a time frame on things, but <laughs> I mean, down the road, and I mean, we could be talking 10, 20, 30 years in our lifetimes, mm -hmm. there could be organs on demand using the 
this technology, wouldn't you say? And it would eliminate people waiting years and years for and, and dying and while dying waiting. while waiting for uh, uh, donor organs, correct? Well, you know, certainly is one of the hopes, right? So if we had our magic wand, we would say, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had these printers and we could just push a button and have any organ we would want? And again, you know, maybe if we look forward 100 years from now, you can say, boy, you know, this is really possible. I think that definitely the science is one where we are creating these tissues and organs for patients. We know we have already implanted a number of them into patients. We are now using the printing technology to really help us scale up the technology to really make sure that we can reproducibly create these for patients and with higher numbers in terms of need and to be able to use this adequately with good long-term functional outcomes. It just seems like something out of a science fiction. It is, really. It's better than science fiction. Yeah. Another thing that you're working on is something called a body on a chip, which are miniaturized organ systems that should fit on a two inch square little chip, essentially, where you can test drugs and and, uh, human reactions and things like that. Tell us a a bit about that. Yeah, so basically using the same strategies that we use to create tissues for patients, we actually then create very miniature, small structures, heart, liver, lung, kidney, and then we put them on a chip, and then we combine that with biosensing technology where we can then test these organs to screen drugs for both efficacy as well as toxicity. And not have to use them on animals and and things like that. That's right. By using these strategies, you can then test these drugs against very similar tissues that humans would have as opposed to testing them in animals or cell lines, which are not really tissues or organs either. How far are we of uh, reproduce a kidney? Because one of the most enormous type of problems today, today in society is people are dying with kidney failure and, and, and they need to wait, uh, I mean, yes. in line. And usually uh, it's not enough tissue to be able to do a replacement on, this, on these organs. How far are we with a kidney? Well, you know, we haven't implanted any of our engineered kidneys in patients yet, but we are using cell therapy to treat patients with kidney disease. So that's the first thing that we are doing now. The future really is now reserved for actually putting in some of these constructs into patients. Thank you so much for what you've contributed to medicine. Thank you.